Thank you for introducing yourselves. Just to go over a quick, a few logistical um, elements. We ask that everyone stays muted and off video as our presenters will be sharing their videos when they are presenting and for bandwidth issues, as I'm sure you all know, um, sometimes we struggle with having the video on. So if you could stay muted unless um, you are asking a question and are called upon, that would be great. We will be going through a number of different uh, presentations and you can feel free to answer or to ask questions in the chat box and we'll do our best to answer them all. So thank you for joining and I'm gonna turn it over to Monde for a quick introduction. Thank you so much, um, Sophia. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our online Accountability 101 workshop um, hosted by FP2030. My name is Mande Limbu. I'm the Global Initiatives Director at FP2030 based in Washington, DC. Uh, I'm so glad that you're all able to join us and look forward to a fruitful and engaging discussion today. Um, as you all know, we launched the commitment making process um, and countries have officially been invited to make FP2030 commitments. And I know many of you have started the process already. And to support that, uh, we created a commitment toolkit, which outlines among other things, uh, recommended steps for uh, making and launching a commitment at the country level. Uh, so we are hosting this session today to orient you uh, as country commitment makers to FP2030's commitment guidance that's focused on strengthening accountability, which is step six um, of the toolkit. One of the key features in the commitment making process this time is a strong focus on inclusion, transparency, um, and accountability. As a partnership, we seek to strengthen accountability within the commitment process for both government and other commitment uh, makers. So as part of the um, commitment intake form, we have requested that countries include their framework and, and or their approach for how they will track their commitments. And this could be um, a new approach or a strengthened existing approach. So we hope today's uh, discussion will enhance your understanding of the recommended framework um, for mutual accountability. Next slide, Emma. Uh, we, we hope it will enhance your understanding of the, of the recommended framework, uh, as well as encourage you to adopt the recommended um, guiding principles and, and examples of um, successful accountability approaches to, to your country context. Um, in this discussion, we are targeting FP2030 focal points and all country partners that are involved in one way or another in the commitment making process. Next slide, please. Before we start our discussion, I'd like to thank um, our guest speakers. Um, I'm not sure if Dr. Moses Mwonge is on the line already, but we have Dr. Moses Mwonge from Samasha, Uganda, uh, Dini Hariati, our CSO focal point from Yayas and Septa, Indonesia, Patience Mgoli Mwali, our CSO focal point from Care Malawi, Amos Mwale, uh, Mwale from Center for Reproductive Health and Education, Zambia, and Medha Sharma, our youth focal point from Visible Impact, um, Nepal. So we're thanking them for agreeing to share with us their insights um, based on lessons they've learned implementing various accountability mechanisms over the years. They will be uh, responding to your questions in the chat box. Um, uh, as well, you will also get a chance to ask other questions during um, and, and have a conversation with them during the breakout sessions. So with that short introduction, I'll now turn over to uh, Sophie who will lead us, um, who will lead an icebreaker exercise for us. Sophie, to you. Great, thank you. Um, next slide, or you can just transfer over to the mentee poll, Emma. So we have a few questions that we wanted to get started. Um, to just get everyone's minds working on, to, uh, on accountability. So the first question is, rate one to 10, how your country advanced accountability for FP 2020 commitments. So I'm gonna post a link in the chat where you can head over to Mentimeter um, and, and input your answer just uh, one through 10 and um, think through how, like what, what accountability framework you all had during the um, FE 2020 commitments, 
um, what structure was in place then. And um, yeah, and, and then we'll be moving on to thinking through FP 2030 commitments. So I'm seeing some fours and fives. 110, that's great. Sixes and sevens, yeah. Great. This is this is really interesting to see, you know, the range and, and hopefully in this in the new FP2030 commitments, um, there'll be more tens for sure. <laughs> I'll give it a few minutes for everyone to to vote. Again, the link is in the chat box. If you just click on it, it should take you immediately to the page where you can vote. I'm seeing a lot of sixes, which is better than five. This is better than halfway. <laughs> and this is helpful for us as well to, to kind of think through how best we can support the accountability frameworks as well. So I'll go ahead and move on to the next question, but you can still continue to vote. So it's the same link, um, It's if you click it again, and it, it'll just allow you to put in a few questions um, or a few words on what went well, what went well during your, the, on the accountability aspects of your FP 2020 commitment. There's a lot of elements to accountability, obviously, and um, I'm sure some, some went well, some could have been improved. So we'll start off with what went well it's nice to start off positively. Um, and you can just put in one to three words on what went well. And again, it should be the exact same link. I know it takes a few seconds for sometimes it to show up, but you don't have to be shy. <laughs> Here, oh great. More funding for FP from donors. CSS participation to ensure accountability, great partnerships, diverse engagement of stakeholders, country investment increase. That's awesome. With FP 2020, yeah. Youth inclusion, that's also great to hear. We're hoping you know, for further CSO and youth inclusion and in these new, in the FP 2030 commitment process as well. Government committing to increase allocation of domestic financing. Great. I'm so glad that all of these things worked super well and I'm hoping that they'll continue to work well in the next in the next partnership. We'll give it a few minutes for everyone to commitment making. Yeah, commitment making in itself. <laughs> Creation of EIP secretariat, yeah. So many elements. Thank you so much for sharing and we'll be sure to keep these in mind as we're as we're working through both this this workshop, but also in the future on on where to support and what already is working well. Great. Okay, and for our final question, if you could just go to the last slide. It's kind of just a similar, a similar idea, but what could be improved? So, you know, what, what didn't work in the previous commitments process and what do you think is important to, to make sure works this time? And again, it's the same link, hopefully. <laughs> Better youth engagement, yep. Accountability at the community level, yeah. yeah. Accountability at every level is really important. Monitoring data systems. Oh, I'm seeing another better youth engagement. I know that we have several of our youth focal points on the line, so I'm excited for those group conversations. We have better community level engagement in the chat as well. Thanks, patience. Countries resilience strengthening. Yeah, these are these are great, and, and hopefully, these are these are definitely things that we've been thinking about as well, and are baked into the guidance, um, the accountability guidance in in the toolkit. So, it's great to hear that these are also things that that you wish to be improved. We'll give it a few more seconds. 
before I hand it over to Moses, who, Moses, are you on the line? I don't know if I saw you here. I don't think he's on the line, but that's okay. I, I can just um, do the partnerships reflections. Okay, great. So do you want to keep it here, Monday, and I'll hand it back over to you? Or do you want to go back to the slides? Actually, you can go back to the slides and do the lesson slide, which is um, basically our, our reflection. So thank you, um, everyone, uh, for, for, for your reflections about what went well and what needs some, some improvement as far as your, um, you know, your, your country experiences are. Um, we had invited uh, Dr. Moses Mwonge to give his um, insights um, as, as a technical expert in accountability to reflect on the partnership in general. But unfortunately, I, I, I am aware that he was unwell last week. Uh, so, so maybe he's still unwell, but that's okay. Um, I'm happy to share the partnership um, reflections in terms of you know, what we think went well and in terms also of um, what we have learned. Um, so in 20, 20, early 2020, um, we did a partners consultation with PAI and um, as we were wrapping up FP 2020 and we were taking stock of our processes and structures, um, among the questions that we asked ourselves were, when governments make commitments, what mechanism exists to hold them to account for the commitments they have made? What is the role of civil society and other partners in making, in monitoring those commitments and collaborating with governments to accelerate the, their implementation? Is civil society, and when we say civil society, we uh, mean including youth-led organizations, are they being meaningfully engaged um, in the process of creating and tracking commitments? And um, is the civil society perspective being systematically captured in the annual country reporting processes? So here are some um, uh, of the things that um, we learned as, as a partnership. And many of, of those you've actually um, also mentioned in your reflections. So even though um, at its most fundamental level, accountability is defined in terms of answerability, meaning duty bearers, in this case, governments must answer to their constituencies for their decisions, or the decisions they make or the actions they take. In the FP 2030 view, um, accountability is most effective when mechanisms are understood as a joint collaborative effort between the government and key stakeholders. And hence the focus on mutual or joint accountability approaches as, as we'll discuss in the next slides or the next session. The other thing that was clear is that in the FP2020 partnership, um, we focused more on outcome tracking and ultimate results using our core indicators to gauge whether family planning outcomes are improving. So while this is great and, and it provided data on country progress and it still does, um, there, were, uh, there was less focus on commitment tracking uh, which focuses on the specific commitments and, and uh, qualitative aspects, including you know, pledges to foster an enabling environment or enhancing women's agency. So questions like, are the programs being implemented? Are the funds being disbursed? Are the policy changes being enacted, et cetera? Um, there, there was less focus on that and, and more focus on, on, on um, uh, tracking um, the indicators, uh, but, bo but, but both are needed to tell the full picture. We also assessed our country annual self-reporting system as a, as a key tool for tracking progress on commitments. And the feedback from partners was, was that, um, yes, civil society and youth focal points do contribute to these self-reports, but participation by the wider civil society community in discussing and, and reviewing the reports was inconsistent. So they recommended that um, a consultative review of the government self-reporting uh, should include external validation where um, reports are widely discussed by partners um, at the country level. So I'll go quickly through the, through the rest of the lessons. Um, as you know, in many countries, there was limited involvement of civil society in drafting previous commitments, which in some cases um, led to limited understanding of the commitments, ambiguities, which in turn affected accountability efforts. And that is why this time we're working to um, ensure civil society partners collaborate and uh, support governments in creating clear and actionable commitments. Um, you all mentioned subnational um, 
accountability that came out very strongly. The, the findings show that in majority of FP20, 20 countries then, um, in, in majority of the countries, subnational accountability efforts were not very strong. And, and lastly, um, the ability of civil society to engage governments and hold them accountable uh, really varies uh, between countries and even uh, within um, countries. So these are some of the, um, the lessons that we've learned um, over the years. And we use these um, lessons to inform the recommendations we have included in the commitment guidance for 2030 commitments, uh, which we hope will help um, shape and strengthen countries' accountability frameworks for, for the, you know, the, the new commitments. Next slide, please, Sophie, I mean, Emma. So if you have not yet seen the commitment toolkit, we have included the link um, on this slide. Basically, step six of, of the commitment toolkit focuses on defining a country commitment accountability approach. The accountability guidance um, includes six main sections, um, the, the framing for accountability, definition and how we frame accountability as FP2030, elements of accountability, guiding principles. We've included key considerations, examples of promising um, accountability approaches um, and a number of resources. The intention here um, is not to be prescriptive but we hope countries um, and, and you all will use this information as um, you're either designing new or improving or expanding existing accountability mechanisms. Um, so again, I'll go through the kind of three more slides very quickly. If you have any questions um, in between, as, as I go through these slides, please type in the chat box and uh, my secretariat colleagues um, uh, will respond as we go. Next slide, Emma. So in terms of our framing for um, accountability, like I said earlier, while governments are responsible for delivering on commitments, they cannot do it alone. And hence, um, we are encouraging a collaborative approach that depends on trust and goodwill between governments and civil society. It's basically a, the, an approach where everyone has a role to play. And by that, we mean FP 2030 support network as the Secretariat Future Regional Hubs. We'll ensure information um, on country progress is shared through annual reports and, and country updates. We have implementing partners who support the commitments by implementing programs consistent with national priorities. We have donors who you know, continue to support commitments through financial and technical assistance. And then we have civil society driving accountability, working in collaboration with governments to monitor progress and advocate for action. Next slide. We've included um, e um, elements of accountability. And, and basically these are the things that we are hoping that countries will take into consideration as they think about their own accountability approaches. Again, a mutual accountability approach, accountability processes that span the full cycle of the commitment, meaning from the drafting to finalization launching to implementation. Alignment with the measurement framework. Um, we just finalized our FP2030 measurement framework, as, as uh, many of you um, are aware. Um, and again, that's focused more on the indicators, but trying to make sure how that then aligns with tracking of the commitments to be able to tell a full picture of where the country is in terms of um, commitments realization. And lastly, where uh, possible, um, to extend accountability approaches to subnational level. And you all uh, mentioned that as, as a key thing that you'd want us to, um, you'd want to see improved. Next slide, please. So we also in the guidance um, included guiding principles. And um, if you look at, I will encourage you to, to read this in the, in the guidance itself, because we have uh, broken this down and, and under each of these principles, there are a number of bullets, which you could actually use as, as a checklist to be able to know, um, to tell whether you're actually adhering to, to these guiding principles as you're you know, designing, your, designing your framework. A collaborative community driven approach uh, that emphasizes on civil society. We've already talked about that accountability processes that align with other national processes and, and commitments. Um, here we, we mean, uh, we understand that countries are, are 
made other commitments, not just FP2030 commitments, ICPB commitments and others. So there may already be accountability processes for those commitments. So trying to make sure that we are not um, creating uh, parallel processes and we are you know, encouraging uh, countries to align to the existing uh, processes. Clearly defined commitment goals. So this goes back to even when countries are thinking of their commitments and, and their goals and having a plan for achieving in process for, for measuring. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, inclusiveness, um, that's embedded throughout the commitment process, visibility and transparency. Uh, we, we think that's key uh, and it needs to, um, they need to be promoted within the development and, and monitoring of commitments. And then lastly, um, an accountability approach that fosters greater compliance among all stakeholders. And, and by compliance here, yeah, we don't mean the legal compliance, but we mean uh, stakeholders coming to an agreement in, in terms of what actions or what steps uh, should be taken in, um, in, in case um, some commitments are lagging uh, behind. So I would really encourage there's more information um, under each of these guiding principles. I just gave a high level overview. Please um, do read uh, the, the guidance for, for more information. Next slide, Emma. So lastly, um, in the guidance itself, we've included a number of um, promising accountability examples. Um, and, and these um, were selected by a number of partners, including some of you all in, in, in terms of um, you know, the number of countries that they've been implemented and, and how people you know, view um, they, they, you know, how successful they are. So today we are going to be focusing only on uh, four, the motion tracker, the community scorecards, and the common framework and the youth-led accountability um, approach. And we invited um, our friends and, and, and partners from um, different countries uh, to tell us a little bit about this or to share their insights um, about these approaches and really um, not to go through the step-by-step -step of, you know, what these approaches are or how do you go about implementing them because that information is in the toolkit. So if you're interested in learning more about any of these approaches or others are, that are in the toolkit, um, I, again, I encourage you to um, read um, all information is in the, in the guidance. But really, we wanted to invite the speakers to talk about what lessons they've learned and, and you know, what key factors that they wanted to share with everyone who is uh, probably considering um, adopting these approaches um, um, in their, you know, to their country context. So with that, um, next slide, please. We'll move to our country spotlights um, section uh, where I'll invite our four speakers to very briefly do a kind of a rapid fire um, presentation um, to, to talk about these approaches. Uh, so first I will start with uh, Dini Ariati from Indonesia, who's gonna be uh, speaking um, on the motion tracker implementation in Indonesia. Dini, over to you. Uh, thanks, uh, Mandy. Uh, good morning, uh, afternoon and evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dini and I'm with uh, Yayasan Cipta Indonesia, and Yayasan Cipta is a local uh, NGO. Uh, and currently uh, we are uh, appointed as the Indonesia Family Planning 2020 uh, CSO Focal Point. And um, uh, Indonesia is one of the countries that has pledged uh, to enable 100, uh, 120 million women and girls to use uh, contraceptives by 2020 at the London Summit on Family Planning uh, 2012. And Indonesia renewed uh, its commitments in 2017 uh, to increase uh, domestic investment uh, for family planning. And um, civil society organizations uh, are powerful uh, forces uh, to monitor and hold uh, government accountable uh, to their promises, including uh, to uh, uh, the Family Planning 2020 uh, commitments. And despite uh, good intentions, uh, there are rarely uh, country mechanisms uh, to help civil society organizations or CSO uh, to learn about and also understand and track uh, those uh, commitments um, and also a transparent and strong monitoring system that foster accountability is needed uh, to ensure that countries uh, stay on track and meet uh, their uh, commitments. 
And since 2019, uh, Yayasan Cipta partnered with uh, Samasya Medical Foundation uh, and also Population Action International to implement uh, the Motion Tracker. The motion Tracker is a six-step uh, customizable uh, framework to strengthen accountability and to drive uh, local action in monitoring progress uh, towards achieving uh, FP2020 goals. Uh, the motion tracker aims to um, increase uh, understanding and generate uh, consensus among CSOs on what needs uh, to be done for governments and uh, to meet their uh, family planning uh, commitments. Uh, the motion tracker consists of four steps uh, and we have been uh, uh, undertook uh, uh, the, the motion tracker since 2019. And uh, those uh, steps are uh, commitments identification uh, and deconstructions, uh, indicators development, and validation, data collection, and also analysis. And to ensure that uh, uh, participatory and engaged uh, monitoring efforts, uh, the motion tracker indicators was developed uh, together and also validated by uh, Family Planning uh, 2020 Indonesia Focal Points and also uh, Country Committee. Country Committee consists of a wide range of stakeholders uh, who are invested in the advancement of family planning uh, in uh, Indonesia. And from the last report, uh, uh, it showed that Indonesia is on track uh, to meet its commitments, spe uh, spe specifically uh, in family planning budget allocation, supply chain uh, management, and South-South uh, exchange activities. With around um, uh, 41 uh, CSO's uh, contribution uh, being documented. And uh, meanwhile, for other commitments, government uh, in collaboration with CSOs and partners, uh, we have made uh, significant advances in implementing a national uh, health insurance scheme, uh, developing guidelines to improve contraceptive supply chain management, and so on. And this progress results uh, were then disseminated and discussed uh, in a stakeholder meeting uh, proposed by the government, donors, uh, CSOs, and others. And this process is conducted on a quarterly uh, basis. And uh, from uh, the motion tracker, we learned that uh, commitments are not only uh, just made, but its progress also needs to be monitored and uh, highlighted. And the motion tracker uh, helps uh, to keep uh, the commitments visible and help uh, harnessing uh, collective efforts and uh, as well as fostering stakeholders uh, engagement and participation to address uh, bottlenecks to achieving uh, Family Planning 2020 uh, commitments. And by involving uh, multiple sectors in the tracking process uh, from the construction to develop uh, the performance indicators, uh, the motion tracker ensures that the government accountability and uh, promote uh, the ownership to the stakeholders that play a strategic role uh, in fulfilling uh, the commitments. And moreover, uh, this uh, motion tracker result uh, uh, is used uh, as the base for uh, uh, Family Planning 2030 uh, recommitment process uh, in Indonesia. So I think uh, that's all uh, uh, brief information about the motion tracker, and I'm happy uh, to discuss uh, about this uh, further. Thank you. Over to you, Monday. Monday, you're on mute. <clears throat> I am so sorry. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dini. Again, if people have uh, um, any questions for um, Dini or any of the speakers, please uh, type your questions in the chat box and we'll um, respond to them as, as we go and have, uh, have more discussion in the breakout session. Um, so now I'd like to invite patients, um, um, Goli Mwale from Malawi, who is going to be sharing uh, lessons um, from from the implementation of the community scorecard um, in Malawi. Patience, over to you. Thank you, Mande. Um, good morning, afternoon and evening, wherever you are. And thanks for joining us. And um, I'll be sharing uh, one of the accountability tools as Mande has highlighted that um, Malawi has um, used uh, in different contexts. I know it's known globally, but we'll be sharing the context of Malawi. And I'm um, patients in Goli Mwade um, with Care Malawi as, uh, and also the FP2020 CSO focal point person. Um, our, um, our journey, I think, and the um, commitment to family planning needs basically was rooted on um, the understanding of uh, 
uh, having the communities and uh, thriving and vibrant. And uh, the community scorecard process basically was developed by Kea Malawi uh, basically in 2002 as a tool to address local challenges and has been recognized globally as an important solution for high quality and responsive as well as contextually appropriate programming. So within that context, um, Kea Malawi used it in the family planning context basically to have to understand what are the community needs and demands and the gaps when it comes to family planning. So the process we've been using it to elevate community voice engaging power holders in negotiating for expanded and more inclusive safe spaces for dialogue. Uh, basically, it promotes mutual accountability, um, is um, Monday highlighted, and that holds the rights of women and girls and also other marginalized groups. So with family planning, you understand that most of the times we'll be pushing the burden to the women to say family planning is for women. But with community scorecard, we wanted a holistic engagement for men to come in the space and understand what is their role in this. So though initially developed for health, uh, this tool has been of course ad adapted and used across um, various settings, but uh, uh, the process basically improves accountability across the range of stakeholders. And um, it's, um, it's, um, it's um, just the process brings together users on one hand, who are women, men and youth. Um, you can talk of in, uh, out of school or in, uh, in school youth and also service providers on the other hand. And this can be government officials, parliamentarians and um, NGOs. And the process, the nice thing about it basically for those who understand it, it's um, the unit analysis, it takes the community. You can choose a health center. You can you really go to the last mile where the services are being consumed. And each of these constituencies will be meeting in groups of their peers um, to allow for voice and comfort in terms of um, uh, discussing what is going well and what is not going well and what can be done about it in terms of identifying gaps and problems within service provision, including rights violation. So these groups will come and create perspective-based indicators to track progress. And this, this progress is what now is feeding into what we understand by how family planning programming is in the country. Citizens and pro, um, service providers meet regularly through interface meeting now to track progress, shift and iterate their action plans um, as needed. So basically they will discuss those indicators and agree to say, I think this is where we're not, um, moving and then we need to do this and roles are shared um, and groups participating in the process collaborate to develop solutions that are joint plans tracked by other users and providers. So within those um, spectrums we've applied it in family planning context and one key result, tangible result that we generated is Care Malau was uh, we've seen um, issues to do with the trust building uh, between service providers and consumers uh, and, and uh, and users, basically you're talking about women who are consumers of family planning or men are trusting the process to say, I think um, we misunderstood what family planning is all about. You've see, we've seen issues to do with client satisfaction. Um, when we were pushing about method mix and uh, service providers struggling to say, what, what, how can we ensure that we're providing the method mix uh, when we are um, labored? So, um, the communities will bring in solutions to say, we'll take it up with it, maybe subnationals to lobby for more human resource in a, in a particular context and facility. And also we've seen, seen scaling of youth-led comprehensive sexual education in schools as well, using the process because now the youth are more engaged and, and um, participating. And in North Kivu, um, just to divert away from Malawi, we've seen this um, also within care context, uh, the process being used uh, and um, to address and identify crisis affected young people uh, and how they identified adolescent friendly services for themselves. And tangible actions for the community were drawn um, out of the process to deliver these adolescent friendly SRHR services. And um, key issue that I wanted to share with you today is I think with the coming in of pandemic, in the lockdowns, for those who know the process, uh, you would find that um, um, the process normally allows gathering of communities. And then with COVID-19, uh, one key issue that was coming out was we need to stop uh, group gatherings. 
um, we quickly diverted in Malawi to say, let's use um, the digital platform. And we converted to SMS platforms and WhatsApp groups. Um, and these were even grouped to uh, groups of women, men, young people, and community leaders. And they were sharing their experiences in terms of access and utilization and quality of services when it comes to family planning and other COVID-related uh, related services. So these virtual groups were used and um, the, the information coming out, key complaints that we got out of this after synthesizing the information was that we noted that we, there was a lot of stock out on PPEs and contraceptives, especially long acting methods. And also it, there were a lot of barriers to youth access, more especially youth friendly outlet serv services uh, and um, offices were shut down. And also a lot of discrimination against youth as community work, work, health workers were rationing the little um, stocks, family planning stocks that they had. And among others also, we saw spikes in adolescent pregnancy and early forced marriages. That accorded us the opportunity to quickly act in and uh, push that information to the, from, to the subnational and uh, district, na, district government, uh, to district and subnational uh, governments uh, for a, uh, and a, it, it um, accorded a dialogue around SRHR and COVID policy. And also that information, since it was coming real time, uh, immediate um, action was taken in terms of um, um, where there were gaps that were being identified. Uh, and uh, key takeaways that I want to leave with you um, at this time is basically um, uh, with the community scorecard, um, we have seen that it's a powerful tool in when it comes to accountability. And um, basically when you want uh, to engage the communities um, and you want to understand their, uh, for them to really understand their entitlements and also to, to accord the space to voice out in terms of programming, this is the, um, uh, the right process. And uh, another additional point is that uh, clear engagement of communities, uh, basically you, the grouping of women, men, youth, you'd find that they are grouped in, in comfortable spaces where they can voice out their fears and also their understanding of how the government committed and if there are any gaps and what role can they play in trying to amplify uh, the commitments that the government made. Thank you so much for listening. Over to you, Mandy. Thank you so much, uh, Patience, uh, for, for your reflection. Um, I, I really admire CARE's work on, on community scorecard and, and the fact that it just really, um, you know, allows for that space for dialogue between citizens, um, you know, local authorities and um, providers in some cases and, and, and really uh, brings that community engagement um, aspect for, um, you know, tracking quality of services and all that. So hopefully, um, uh, people have learned um, about the, the, you know, the, the approach. And if there are um, additional questions, they'll definitely, um, we'll get back to you. Now, um, over to Emos Mwale from uh, Zambia to share experiences um, on implementing the common framework um, tool in, in Zambia. Emos, over to you. Thanks, Mandy, and uh, good morning, colleagues from the morning side. Good afternoon, colleagues in the afternoon time, and good, good evening, colleagues from the evening time. That's in Asia. It's good to see some of you on the platform. I think it's been a while. So for me, I quickly want to share some of the highlights that we have been going through when we are implementing the common framework for tracking uh, family planning, resource allocation, expenditure, and also how the governments are actually using the, the, the common framework. So this common framework is being implemented in Malawi, Nigeria, Tanzania, Kenya, and uh, Uganda, including Zambia. We have uh, been doing this in partnership with uh, uh, PAI, I think it's been happening for some time. It had its own challenges, but now I think with uh, the teething, we are able to see how real timing and real tracking actually is done. It's easy to use. It's a tool that shows expenditure. First, it shows allocation, then it shows the displacement, then it shows the actual expenditure. 
So it tells you how a country actually is spending the government resources in terms of uh, commodities on family planning, even on family planning programs. So to be very uh, practical, um, it has specific indicators when we are tracking resources. We look at um, how are other countries actually performing when we are allocating res uh, resources. So for instance, the common framework puts pressure on peers to ensure that they get motivated in terms of how, for, uh, for example, Uganda is allocating the resources towards family planning, how much they are, they are dispersing those resources that they have allocated and how this, the expenditure has been done. So you'd see that if Zambia is not doing well, then they'll be able to, to emulate Uganda or Tanzania or, or Nigeria. This is also vice versa. If Zambia is doing well, the other countries are coping. They have also ensured that the other um, resources are being used, the allocated is being dispensed, and the dispensed is being actually spent on the right uh, um, products which they are buying. So for, for instance, one other example I want to share with uh, everyone else is that for Zambia, we have two separate budgets. We have a budget for actual family planning programs, and then we also have a budget for commodities. So that is something that our colleagues have also learned and are pushing their governments to ensure that they have a family planning programs budget that they are able to use and also track that uh, allocation and also see how the funds are being used. So the common framework promotes transparency. Like I've said, it promotes government accountability. It also shows the actual allocation. It shows the expenditure on commodities. It also enhances and it promotes peer-to-peer -peer discussions in terms of how they are able to use um, the resources. Over to you, Mandy. And if there are any further questions, I think Moses is online. He should be able to add more on the motion tracker and the common framework, especially that is uh, a colleague that we have been working with during this process. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Amos, for sharing. Definitely a great approach uh, for, for tracking um, funding uh, allocation and, and expenditures. So lastly, we have... Um, Medha Shama from, from Nepal, um, and we wanted Medha, I, I know initially when we did the mentee, um, you know, when we're doing the break, the icebreaker, there were, in, in terms of what went well, some mentioned youth inclusion, but in terms of what needs to improve, a lot of you uh, mentioned that we need to uh, make sure that um, we, we're, we're improving in terms of um, youth inclusion. So I would like to invite Medha to uh, talk a little bit about her experience um, in terms of engagement of young people in accountability processes and, and just um, his um, her insights on youth-led accountability uh, and where that is um, in Nepal and, and hopefully in the region as well, if she has that information. So welcome, Medha. Hi, Mande. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me today. Um, so you see, uh, today's young people are going to uh, graduate their youth age, uh, along with some important global mechanisms like SDG um, or ICPD plus 35 or FP 2030. Um, so whatever is going to be decided in these platforms, uh, we young people are going to bear the consequences the most, like whether it's good or bad. Um, so undoubtedly, it's imperative that young people are not only engaged in the commitment process, but also seen as the torch bearers in the accountability mechanism as well. Um, unfortunately, we are not there yet. You know, at least for Nepal, I can say uh, that youth engagement is being accepted now more than ever, with young people's roles slowly evolving from beneficiaries uh, to contributors, and that's great. Um, but when we are talking about higher level roles, like policy making or being the watchdog, it's still difficult to find those spaces. We have had some successes um, in the FP 20, uh, 2020 and other processes, um, but as a youth community, we are also trying to come together and put together the, um, the achievements we have made uh, so that we can collaborate and go forward together. Um, so I wanna share about some of uh, those key lessons. 
The first one is that uh, youth-led accountability is not possible uh, without having youth at those higher tables. So as a youth focal point of uh, FP2030 myself, I do realize that I am now in a much better position uh, to question the accountability and influence the joint reporting for um, FP2020 and 2030 process. Um, so my engagement, my visibility, and my role as youth focal point has been much more credible uh, with this representation. And I I do realize that you know that wouldn't have been possible like people would probably not hear my voices if I didn't have that uh, youth focal point uh, tag with myself. Um, secondly, um, I, I, I feel that young uh, people have always needed to make extra efforts than others to gain those uh, or the same leverage. Um, so even in Nepal, after the restructuring from unitary to federal uh, structure recently in 2017, um, Nepal's young people have been able to engage with their local governments to some extent. And even at this time of COVID, young people are doing their best. Um, they are questioning the government. They are leading accountability at the grassroots. And we should definitely use some of these learning for uh, establishing um, youth -led accountability for the recommitment process as well. Thirdly, uh, young people need to start early. Uh, so, you know, during the ICPD plus 25 commitment process in Nepal in 2019, uh, one strategy that we youth organization took was to have our foot forward already um, so that when other CSOs were starting the commitment process, we had already done um, youth consultations and had a call to action at hand. So what that supported us to do was um, things started falling in place. So we were um, invited uh, to CSO consultations and we were more prepared. And we were also able to influence the government's um, commitment making process. And the government made a really strong commitment about young people at ICBG Forum. And not only that, um, Nepal saw really great engagement of um, youth um, in, in Nairobi as well. And even after the return, uh, we young people have been uh, able to follow up. So we meet every six months and try to track the commitments that's been made by the government and the civil society organization. And we think that we could be engaged in all the process throughout just because uh, we were able to uh, start early. Um, finally, even small investment in capacity building of young people yields much more. Um, so during Nepal's uh, CDR review process in 2018, one interesting thing happened was um, one organization offered capacity development uh, for the CDR process to all the participants. And um, at that time, it was also one of the biggest festivals of Nepal. So uh, many organizations decided to attend the main um, event only and not participate in the capacity development process ahead. But we young people, we decided to give up the festivals and we uh, reached the place um, earlier and then we participated in the capacity development and what that did was it provided us with much more confidence and we were able to influence the advocacy um, uh, process of the CEDAW. And as a result, that year, uh, CEDAW saw strongest youth participation from Nepal, and that was not only admired by other CSO uh, partners, but by the CEDAW committee itself as well. Um, so, you know, that's about investing in young people. Um, so I'd like to conclude my, by saying that we need more evidence like this. Like I learned about so many uh, mechanisms even today. So we need uh, more evidences like this uh, so that we we can make everyone hear loud and clear that adolescents and youth have the rights to participate in equal terms with stakeholders on things that matter to us. Um, in Nepal, we are planning to use this strategy for FP 2030 recommitment process as well and make our uh, presence felt. Thank you so much, Monday. Over to you. Thank you so much, Medha, and, and thanks for, for that call. Um, really, uh, youth, youth engagement is, is really important. Um, if we want to um, strengthen our accountability processes moving forward. So thank you all. Um, uh, thank you all the speakers so much for sharing those key lessons. I think it was very informative and I know you'll all be um, available to um, have further discussion um, with, with participants in the breakout sessions. So now uh, turning over to uh, Sophie to lead us on logistics for the breakout groups where we will all get an opportunity to have uh, further conversations in, in terms of the, the actual commitment process, processes in countries, uh, where you are in those processes and, and what are the next steps and, and what support um, that you may need uh, from, from the secretariat. So over to you, Sophie. 
Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Monde. Um, So yes, as Monde said, we're going to be transitioning into small group discussions. Um, you will have both colleagues from ECFI 2030 as well as some of the speakers from today joining your groups to be able to provide any answers to questions you may have. Um, just in terms of logistics, I will be opening all of the breakout rooms. Please be sure to select join breakout room. Sometimes it comes up at the bottom of your screen. Sometimes it comes up in the middle of your screen. But if you could just make sure to select that function um, so that you would actually be able to join the breakout room, that would be great. So I'm going to open the breakouts room rooms now and you should get a notification shortly. And these breakout rooms will be around 25 minutes. Thank you. Uh, welcome back, everyone. I, I hope you all, like Sophie said, had great dialogues and, and dialogue and discussion. Um, the discussion was um, informative to you. It was to me. Um, I think in my group, we really, um, you know, got to, to hear where countries are in terms of what they're thinking about accountability and the, the you know, various um, approaches that they're thinking of um, implementing to, to make uh, accountability a, a reality in, in this new um, iteration of the partnership. So we don't have uh, a lot of time uh, for, a, for a report back from um, all the groups, but I would like to invite uh, maybe two, two to three people to quickly share um, uh, a few kind of key takeaways from, from the conversations that I just had, uh, that we just had. So I would uh, probably start with a, a group facilitator, um, but I would also need um, two more volunteers uh, to, to go after this first speaker to just share very briefly, like two minutes, uh, what kind of stood out for you uh, during the discussion. So I would like first to invite Emily, who uh, facilitated one of the group um, uh, discussions to, to share, um, you know, some um, key takeaways from that uh, conversation. And um, as she's speaking, please, two, two more um, volunteers, um, prepare yourselves. Emily? Great, thanks, Monday. So in my um, group, we mostly heard from colleagues in Nigeria, um, Malawi, and, and Pakistan. And what was interesting um, from our group was that uh, a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of countries are taking time to set the tone a bit and prepare different groups. So in Nigeria, there's a there going to be a heavy focus on using media in the accountability process, um, and the engagements with the media have already kicked off, doing big uh, big events with over a hundred media outlets from all over the country have been key, while also not abandoning the accountability mechanisms that were already in place, like the motion tracker and expanding upon that and making sure there are more groups that are engaged. And then in Pakistan, they are for the first time, if I'm remembering correctly, um, um, Mr. Dr. Talib, um, that the approach of a national dashboard has now been introduced, which wasn't there before, um, and really using subnational um, because Pakistan's so decentralized, having a national subnational groups is really going to be key to their process. Um, and then in Malawi, patients mentioned that, which I think is really fascinating, um, that oftentimes historically accountability has really been perhaps sometimes directed at the wrong partners. Um, for example, in Malawi, the context is that most donors and NGOs hold the funding and the programs for family planning initiatives, and therefore the accountability actually needs to account for both the government, perhaps to do more domestic resource mobilization, but also holding those that are the real power holders accountable a bit. Um, and so making sure that who's responsible for what is well understood and that there's a real process in place for that. They're currently using the CIP dashboard um, and, and uh, looking at how to use what's already been done with community scorecards and, and bring that um, up a bit. 
but essentially what I've heard from in our group was everyone setting the tone for mutual accountability, joint accountability, having a greater understanding of who's responsible for what, and then importantly, using a kind a, tra- a tool for transparency um, in the process, whether it's a dashboard, a motion tracker system, or a CIP dashboard or community scorecards, everyone's using a different tool, um, but that the core of it is transparency, mutual accountability, and really holding each other and, and creating a, a greater understanding of um, everyone is responsible for different pieces of this. Um, so that's what I got out of my group. Thank you, oh, thank you so much. Others can correct me if I detailed anything about your country incorrectly, please do. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, um, Emily. Um, Dr. Talib, did you want to add, yeah, correct too. something? <laughs> thank you, Mande Limbo. Uh, and thank you, Emily, for uh, representing the discussions very precisely and in a crisp manner. Uh, you have uh, picked the important points from the discussion. Uh, in terms of Pakistan, I think one or two more things are very important. For example, the at national level, the Supreme Court took a suo moto, and based on that, uh, the Council of Common Interest has taken a decision to uh, to have uh, broad eight recommendations. Now, on based that on that, we have a national task force uh, presided over uh, by the Prime Minister, but now the President of Pakistan takes those meetings, chairs the meetings. And at provincial level, the chief ministers are uh, chairing those meetings uh, in, in provincial task force. So uh, there are three or four meetings uh, at national level and at provincial level. For example, in Sindh province, we had three meetings of the task force. And there's a political will. I mean, uh, once you have a political will, then there's a greater level of accountability starts. Especially when we talk of Sindh province, there's a uh, working group under the chair of Dr. Azra Fazal Peju, who is the Minister for Health and Population. And uh, the broader layers of uh, society, I mean, uh, the judiciary, law enforcement agencies, the media, the parliamentarians, the young people, uh, and the women, they are now uh, from different uh, sections. They are joining, they are coming together for a greater accountability for yeah. the next phase of IP 2030. So thank, thank you, you so much for, uh, for, for those ad- additional insights from uh, Pakistan, um, Dr. Talib. Um, I wonder if Maziko is still on the line and I would like to, um, he has been volunteered actually to share um, um, an update from. Oh, it's Maziko. Oh, I know Maziko very. Hi, Maziko. Long hi, time. hi, how are you, Wendy? <laughs> Good to see you. Um, so, at least to see your name, I haven't seen your face. Um, so, uh, if you can just do a very quick, um, uh, you know, update from from your group. Um, thank you so much. Um, I think uh, Amelia, thank you. <laughs> yeah, in our group, I think, yes, we discussed one of the key things which came up from our group is what also patients has also uh, from Malawi. Uh, my colleague, President Mali, has also mentioned. In our group, I think um, we had discussion in terms of uh, accountability comes at the end uh, of the discussion. Uh, commitments are made, but we found out com- uh, accountability is made at the very end uh, when commitments are, are coming to an end. It's an issue which we need to improve as we're coming up with new commitments for 2030 so that we don't lose out. Uh, but also what another important thing which we are noticing from all the discussion which we had uh, in Nigeria and other countries, it was that um, at least I think we have scorecards uh, which are periodically been uh, been 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 shared in our in our different countries, and uh, this was could be one of our entry point in terms of making sure that uh, uh, the scorecard has been followed, and uh, we're able to to see to it that um, the accountability is taking place in terms of the supply side, but also the availability of commodities to make sure that um, everything is done accordingly. So. In our group, uh, I think one of the take home was uh, how do we make sure that accountability is taken from the, in, in, uh, from the development stage, implementation until the end of the commitment so that we don't lose out. But also another issue which came out was uh, COVID-19 and how do we make sure 
that we don't lose out uh, in terms of integration. I know COVID is taking a lot of time and how do you make sure that the family planning uh, is part and uh, COVID-19 is part of an integrated approach to family planning so that we don't lose out the opportunities which, which are there at the moment to make sure that by 2030, we're able to report on something on how we have implemented the family plan in 2030. So um, basically those are some of the key elements uh, which came out uh, from our group uh, just to uh, to share that um, indeed accountability is key. It's good, it's good that we have started discussing this at the very beginning of, uh, of yeah. commitment so that we don't lose out what comes out uh, when accountability comes at the end. But also uh, who's supposed to champion, um, I think it also came to another group, who's supposed to champion the, um, the accountability. Um, I yeah. think everyone has got a responsibility, but it's because the question is how uh, the, other, uh, the other stakeholders can be championing the same. So it, those are some yeah. of the key elements which we discussed, but also the use of scorecards. How do we use the scorecards? Uh, which type of scorecards do we use? Uh, the family planning and other stock scorecards. But also, as you all know, that family planning um, yeah, is, is also in many, is in many, many frameworks. We have the GFF, the Global Financing Facility. We have the FP2030. Uh, we have so many frameworks. How do we make sure that um, it is integrated so that we don't lose yeah. out in other frameworks as, as we proceed over? Thank you, Monday. Thank you so much. All great um, insights from your group. So lastly, I want to, um, I would like to call uh, Chongi uh, Huan, um, who is also going to do a readout from um, her group. Chongi, over to you. Thank you, Mandesh. So in the group one, we discussed the pretty many different points. So uh, for example, the Philippines still in the earlier stage of the commitment making process, but it's important uh, to have a shared understanding how important the shared accountability and having common goals in the commitment making process is important to uh, for the commitment achievement. Uh, we talked about how we can do uh, to strengthen uh, the components around the youth and also for the meaningful youth engagement across the commitment process as well. So Sheila pointed out it needs a multiple approaches, not a side standalone or just a one shot uh, solution, but including uh, working with the different platforms and network of young people in the country to bring some synergy uh, from them and also working with the policy and decision makers, uh, some high level advocacy, and also working with social media to raise uh, public awareness of the commitment. Um, so including uh, committed engagement. So there are multiple approaches to uh, address the, that um, in better way. And also uh, Amos pointed out, uh, orienting the CSOs on the accountability is critical. Uh, and at B2030 support in terms of, I mean, it's important to share the tools with the right partners. So at B2030 supports in uh, identifying the right partners and actors to share some of those tools, including motion tracker, which is really user friendly. And also um, as other colleagues mentioned that the chat box during the earlier session too, I mean, Sri, Sri Lanka also reiterated some hardship around the uh, community security. So uh, there is, has been a stuck out uh, at the country level. So every 2030 is continued support in terms of addressing that issue, uh, uh, like given the co like uh, continued challenges around the COVID and funding cut. I mean, that's important in terms of the implementing uh, operationalization of uh, commitments as well. So over to you, Monday. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Shongi and, and, and Emily and, and Maziko. Um, we will definitely uh, share the recording from this meeting as well as notes that we've um, taken from this um, group discussion. So for those who have not, um, did not get a chance to, to share, that information um, will be available for everyone. So now I would like to um, invite Dr. Moses Mwonge, um, who was supposed to speak earlier, but he um, was having connection issues. For uh, kind of forward looking, uh, you know, concluding remarks, uh, Dr. Mwonge has been spearheading accountability efforts in many countries, and, and he's also a member of the PME working group, so very familiar um, with uh, FP 2030's measurement framework, as well as the evolution of, um, of our accountability uh, work as a partnership. So Moses, um, over to you for kind of quick uh, concluding remarks. Thank you so much, Monday, and for all the deliberations. And um, I'm really glad that um, accountability is, is really taking root within the FP 2030 um, architecture. 
We've come from very far. And if you look at uh, when we started in FP in, in, in 2012 uh, in London, the partnership was there, it was launched, but the issues that were there, we did not come back to country level and appreciate that it's a partnership rather than government leading. And after all these years, um, we've realized that actually FP 2020 was about partnerships in which civil society development partners and other anthropologists were basically coming together to contribute to the advancement of family planning. And the most important tenant of that was to make sure that we don't pick everything, but each country prioritizes few commitments that will be followed up. And that we had difficulty for the last, I think, 10 years. The reason for that is that most countries picked a lot of commitments, others adopted documents, and it became difficult to really monitor. And also the other weakness we had was that accountability was not strengthened. What we did, we mainly focused on monitoring data, routine data, panel surveys, to be able to monitor commitments. Now, going forward, and this has lesson has led us to believe that the FP2030 um, architecture should look at mutual accountability rather than holding government accountable. And so, I'm so glad that if you look at the new process, this is where we are heading. But also, a lot is going on now. We have countries developing FP family planning costed implementation plans. We have countries like Uganda that have started developing the commitments and the, make and the accountability mechanisms. But members, what I would like us to take from this is that let's make sure that the commitments are specific and focused. We shouldn't pick everything. Of the 20 things, let us pick two or three things as a country that we shall follow up, establish an accountability mechanism, and ensure that by 2030 we celebrate the success. So thank you so much, Monday, and um, I wish everyone the best. Thank you so much, uh, Moses, for, for your remarks. I think you, um, you said it all. So with that, I would like to thank you all for participation, for your participation. This is not the end of this conversation, obviously. Um, if in, in your country team, you would like to have a further conversation uh, or have uh, additional questions, please reach out to me. Uh, we are happy to schedule office hours, um, you know, to, to have further conversations as well as cross-country learning opportunities if you really feel like you need to learn from Zambia or Pakistan or any other country, we can um, facilitate those um, discussions. We are also going to continue to support civil society and youth partners um, engagement in the commitment processes. Um, so if there are any questions regarding that process, please do reach out to me or my colleague Sophie. Again, uh, we'll, we'll share this meeting's recording as well as notes from the breakout group. Uh, group so uh, you can share with others who were not able uh, to join us today. So with that, uh, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you so much. See you all soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monday, Sophie, and everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.